So that was our global meditation. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Just to learn to be present, to have your attention in the present moment, instead of having your attention continuously being absorbed by the thinking process, the thoughts. So this is our global live healing meditation particularly helpful, I would say, at this present time, as we are finding ourselves in at a time of global disruption, many global challenges arising, and uh, likely, it's likely that the challenges will remain with us and new challenges will come as we are moving into a period of global turbulence. And that's fine. It's a unique opportunity for spiritual awakening, a unique opportunity for disidentifying from the egoic mind and finding the transcendent dimension to who you are. The motivation for awakening, for going deeper, grows for human beings as the challenges grow. And this is the reason why this is potentially an auspicious time. When humans are not being challenged, then the motivation to evolve is not there, it's lacking because you're relatively comfortable in your little comfort zone. But when you're taken out of your comfort zone, when things get disrupted, a huge amount of uncertainty comes into your life, loss, comes into your life or the possibility of loss. And that's often the same thing for people because the possibility of loss is a projected future and you suffer just as much as if you were already in that situation, which may never happen. But all these things uh, potentially become the motivating force for deep, profound, inner change, for a shift in consciousness, for a step forward in the evolution of your consciousness, which is the consciousness of humanity. So we need to rise up to the challenge of our present time, because if we don't, or if you don't, then it will affect you in a very unpleasant way. You suffer more and more, as already millions of people are experiencing suffering, for example, an enormous amount of fear in the collective energy field. Many people are in a state of fear, for example, connected to the virus. And so 
So there's a disruption that occurs on the outside and there's also a disruption that occurs in human consciousness. The most important realization is to become aware of the fact that the most, the most primordial thing in your life, ultimately, the one thing that determines how you experience your life or your reality, determines how you respond or react to events and situations and circumstances, the most primordial fact is not what happens around you. The most important fact or factor is your state of consciousness, the state of consciousness with which you meet the circumstances of your life, the situation of your life. And so if people live unconsciously, they're not aware of this, it's very easy to become a victim of your circumstances. And many, many humans are victim of their circumstances. What does that mean? their inner state of consciousness is completely determined by the external world, by other people, by what happens on the outside, both their personal situation and the collective situation in the world. So they're at the mercy of circumstances. Even, at the, even on the smallest level, at the mercy of another human being, you, come, come, you meet another human being who is angry. If you are not sufficiently present, this human being who is angry will trigger the same emotion in you. And so you are at the mercy of somebody else's state. That's just a small example. And it happens all the time. And then you have the, whatever you absorb through the media these days, the mainstream media, social media, and mainstream media, for example, generates an enormous amount of emotion. It's there because emotion sells, it sells people tune in. It has a, an almost addictive quality to it. And so without knowing it, I don't believe the people who run the media, the mainstream media, are probably not aware of what they're doing, but they themselves are in the grip of this collective energy field underneath the surface of things. And there's a huge amount of collective fear running through. And if you're not sufficiently present, then you have no immunity to what goes on around you. And you are susceptible to catching, so to speak, not, I'm not talking of a virus because there's another kind of immunity that is of a different kind that is within your consciousness, you are then at the mercy of whatever mental virus is floating around in the collective energy field. And without knowing it, it infects you. So you absorb by, watch, by watching an excessive amount of uh, news, <laughs> television or whatever device you use, uh, you absorb all that that collective energy field that you can't see it, it's underneath the surface of things. And you're then taken over by a mental, emotional 
energy field without knowing it. You think that's you. You're identified with this collective energy field. Uh, so it's you've been taken over by what could be described as a virus, a mental virus, a mental emotional virus. And you find yourself in a state of either fear or a state of anger or anxiety. <clears throat> and so, and that's this, when you identify with that state of anger or anxiety or fear, you become it, so to speak, or it becomes you. It becomes part of your identity. And spiritually speaking, we call that unconscious living. To be unconscious is to completely identify with a mental emotional energy field. Identify means you seek yourself in it. It takes you over. You, you don't know yourself except through that. Your consciousness is completely identified with that energy. And that's a terrible state to be in. Now, a state of quite normal. Uh, it's very important then when this becomes more and more unpleasant, fear grows, anger grows, uh, then it's easier for humans to suddenly become aware of what's happening to them. And that is the motivating force that uh, uh, helps people to step out of the identification with the collective streams of emotional mental streams. So that's the most vital thing. You need vigilance so that you are not drawn into these unconscious collective energy fields, which are really very much like a mental virus collective. So there's an equivalent on a mental level to what we have on the physical level. On the physical level, we have the, uh, that the virus that, that we all know about all, all over the world. And the equivalent of that on the mental level is a virus of destructive, negative thought forms and emotions that people get taken over by. And that makes life very unpleasant. It can also lead to an intensification of external problems. When more and more people are being taken over by negative energy fields without knowing it, then they create in the external, they create whatever corresponds to their inner state of consciousness. So this is a time of a very critical time, but it is uh, the most critical element of it, as I see it, is not in the external. Yes, there are external problems, but more fundamentally, it is a problem of human consciousness and it can only be tackled there. This is the root, the, the causal realm is human consciousness. And in order to inhabit a better world, you need to go to the causal realm of your own consciousness. and not seek a better world in the realm of effect, which is the external realm. It doesn't mean you cannot do things in the external realm. Factor in any action that you take is, so if it is action to be ultimately really helpful, 
and beneficial if the underlying mental emotional state out of which this action arises is one of anxiety or fear. It's, it's not possible to take wise action and make wise decisions out of a state of fear. So also um, many people want, they have good intentions. They want to create a better world and that is wonderful. But the, if you neglect the causal realm, which is your consciousness, then whatever you do on the outer, you might be very angry and out of your anger, you want to create a better world. That's dangerous. It's understandable, but it's dangerous because any action you take is contaminated by the energy field of anger and creates in Eastern terms would say creates more karma, more suffering. So the important thing for us is not to be taken over by the collective virus that's floating around and that's everywhere in the media and so on. So be very vigilant. Vigilance is required. It's ultimately, and this is what meditation is all about and this is what healing is all about. Healing in a wider sense, normally healing refers to physical healing, which is wonderful too, but the deeper healing is a healing of your consciousness, the healing of a fragmented consciousness, the healing of the, the suffering that arises when you completely identify with mental emotional streams that come to you, they take you over. And so then you identify with your, all your, every mental positions you have, uh, political views, mental positions, and you derive your sense of self from your position and the other becomes the enemy It does not mean as you awaken out of that, it does not mean that you no longer have any mental positions. You continue to have certain views, for example, with regards to uh, the political situation or the social situation, you have certain views and that's fine. It would be virtually impossible to say I'm now giving up all my viewpoints completely. I'm no longer having any viewpoint and uh, you can't do that, but you can recognize a mental position as a mental position without deriving your sense of self from it. Then when you become involved in a discussion with someone who holds it, and for example, the, in the United States at the present time, there's a huge division. It's almost like two Gradually, two universes are developing that are very separate as a fragmentation. And if you're unconscious, which means you're identified with your mental positions, then when anybody questions your mental position with an opposite mental position, this, the person becomes your enemy. If millions of people live in that unconscious way, uh, civil disorder, even civil war is not impossible. That means millions of people are so identified with their positions that they, uh, they're completely unaware that they are being taken over by an energy field. <clears throat> So the answer is to become aware of 
the positions that your mind is taking and saying, well, this is my position. You can then have a discussion with someone without making the other into an enemy, without attacking the other, either emotionally, mentally, or even physically in the case of very unconscious people. You can have a discussion and perhaps you can arrive at some kind of, you can meet at some point in the middle if you're conscious. If you're unconscious, which means completely identified with your mental position, there's no meeting anymore. You cannot meet the other because the other is the enemy. So uh, the primordial problem, and this is where the healing also comes in, is uh, healing is really the, to, to be restored to wholeness, not to be fragmented and lose yourself in the fragmentation of your mind. And so how does this happen? How can I have a mental position, for example? Even I have certain positions, obviously, every human has with regards to politics. Uh, I don't talk about them because who cares what my mental position is? That's not important. I am here to guide humans to a higher or deeper dimension where they are no longer completely identified with and absorbed by their mental positions, their minds, their thoughts. Then you can have the thoughts, but you have the thoughts are exist within a greater wholeness, which we could call the awareness. And your identity lies in the awareness, the presence, the consciousness, not in the position of the mind. Then you can still have your position, but you're no longer threatened in your sense of identity if somebody questions your position or contradicts. So that's the, and that's the essence of meditation also, the essence of meditation is to find that, to discover that transcendent dimension to who you are, the being of yourself. And you discover it, and this is as I speak, There's an opportunity for you to realize this within yourself as I speak here and now. This transcendent dimension to who you are, the unconditioned being is something that you do not need to bring about through arduous discipline and you cannot generate it by being a good person. It comes before all that. It's already here. You, at that level, you are already complete, perfect, or to use this word, whole. Whole, you are already whole. On the level of being, you are already whole. Now that's an interesting word, whole. W-H-O-L-E, whole. <laughs> on this, on the personal level, the conditioned mental emotional entity, you are not whole. You are, there's a lot still that you could do and many things you cannot do. And you can improve your life on the level of the person. Of course, it's a good thing to improve your life on that level. But the, if you miss 
the fundamental dimension of the transcendent, which is the spiritual dimension, then nothing on the level of the, your personal self will ever ultimately satisfy you, no matter what you achieve on that level. It doesn't mean that you should not strive and to achieve things. It's a good thing to try and achieve things as a human being, to learn new things, experience new things, to grow. This or that beautiful. This is part of why you are here, but it's not enough. And in fact, it's frustrating ultimately and not satisfying if you miss the more fundamental task, the more fundamental human task, which is to awaken to the deeper dimension of who you are beyond the conditioned person. And that's the healing, that's the wholeness. You realize on that level, you are already whole. Healing and whole go back to the same root. In, if you go back the etymology of the in English, healing and whole come back from, to go back to the same root, which lies in Old English, Old High German and Norse, which is Scandinavian language. They all go back, healing and whole, go back to the same root. Sometimes wisdom is embodied sometimes in language. So if you follow it to, to its root, so healing and whole, I have the same root. And then there's another word that is part of that that is, comes out of the same root. And that's the word holy. So the word healing, whole and holy have the same, etymologically have the same root. So you discover a dimension that is always has always been there is not subject to time discover a dimension within yourself that is also the realm of the holy and you cannot define that holy points to the fact that you are intrinsically connected to the source of all life which traditionally is called god the holy points to that. Holy is not a word that you will hear very frequently in our present civilization. Uh, it's unlikely that the word holy has ever been used in the past few years on CNN, MSNBC or Fox News, very unlikely. And the New York Times also, I haven't seen the word holy. I've been looking for it for a long time. No, it's not there. Because humans no longer know, even know what that means. They had the, you can only experience, you can only get a glimpse of what that means within yourself beyond conceptualization. When you go out into nature and you're in a state of pure awareness and you you look at the totality of nature that surrounds you no matter where you are there are trees or there's a landscape or there's the ocean or there's a mountain or just a field or even just a park or even just one tree you give your give it your complete attention then without labeling it without analyzing it without calling it anything you give it your complete attention, then you can sense that beyond that which you see in nature, with your senses or what you can hear, see, hear, take in with your senses, there is something, there is an essence in nature, there is a, a presence in nature that can only be described as holy. Uh, and you're in a state of awe, it's, I like that word, Oh, when you when you're in nature and you go, oh. and of course at that moment your mind stops. You're just conscious. You're not labeling what you perceive, and then you sense the the what we perceive. Uh, every sense perception is a surface reality. Uh, but beyond the surface reality, there's a deeper reality, and you can sense this deeper reality, which ultimately, what is that? It's the universal consciousness that manifests itself in, through countless millions of life forms. 
but underneath it there is the one ultimately the one consciousness the one being and you can sense that when your mind is still you can sense that in nature and then you can sense that there's no not no, not a separation anymore between you and nature the same consciousness but different frequency yes is alive in you as you as the same consciousness that manifests as a plant a tree a flower and so you you sense that connection that is the that is the awakening that's the restoration of wholeness the wholeness of life when the fragmented entity the ego subsides and you become restored to the the wholeness of who you are that's the this is what is needed for sanity to uh, to come back into to you, human interactions the only thing that can save the world is a this shift in consciousness this realization it begins with you and it begins here and now and how does it begin here and now it begins and i'm inviting you now perhaps it's already happening in you but you're not quite aware of it it begins with a moment of no thought but just pure presence or beingness like now that's meditation meditation is thinking subsides awareness remains and when thinking subsides the entire self what we could call the self the egoic self the person the personality also subsides because it's created by the movement of thought so when thinking subsides even for a moment in that moment the conditioned entity the personality also subsides and something else arises and there are many names that we could use to describe that something else that arises that is much deeper much more fundamental than the person many words have been used over centuries and millennia to describe this the most neutral term you could use is the being of you or the beingness of you in uh, it could also be called the atman the innermost the, the divinity within uh, this is from indian spirituality the atman uh, no uh, jesus had certain words for it he called it sometimes he called it the kingdom of heaven which is a dimension of consciousness it's not something you can see it's here or it's there he clearly said you can never say it's here or it's there because it's inseparable from who you are so the kingdom of heaven is another term you can use it to describe that dimension the entire teaching of jesus was about finding that dimension within sometimes he called it other things he also called it eternal life and he said i want you to have eternal life this is that my teaching is this eternal life what does that mean it doesn't mean that the person goes on and on and eternal means timeless the timeless dimension of who you are and then the buddha came 
and the Buddha refused all positive terminology like kingdom of heaven or the Atman or the or eternal life because he knew that humans would fall into the trap of transforming every any positive statement into a mental idol. So he refused to make any positive statements, he used only negative statements. He denies everything that is ultimately not it. So Buddha described it as the no self. <laughs> this is the no self. And that's the ultimate teaching of the Buddha is the to discover within yourself the unreality, ultimate unreality of the person, the personal sense of the egoic sense of self, the self, which also Jesus said when he made the important statement, deny thyself. Huh. That wasn't the Buddha, I thought it could have been said by the Buddha. Jesus said it, deny thyself, deny yourself, meaning, what denies a strange word here. It doesn't mean that you decide to say, oh, I, I don't exist, or that's not it. Deny means, as he uses it, recognize the unreality of the self that you thought you were. That is the denial of self. Deny thyself. Recognize that ultimately that is not the, really who you are. This is just a surface phenomenon. It's, you find that it also has its place. You have to live with it for a while. But the, the deeper dimension is that that is not who you are. So it's vital for humans, especially now as this, uh, we are moving into a critical time period for the totality of humanity, uh, which is also an incredible opportunity for disidentifying from the, the unconsciousness that otherwise governs the world. The, so how do you do it? In a way you don't even do it. It's just a, a cessation of I could almost say the cessation of doing and the realization of being. And doing on a primordial level is thinking. Humans are thinking all the time, except in dreamless sleep. They're thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. And thinking. It's no cessation. And then life gets more and more difficult. Then you watch more and more in the news on TV and whatever it's called. The news is not the news anymore. It's just opinions. It's just stupid manipulation. And you watch him and you get drawn into that and you think it's all so real. And then you see anxiety arises, anger arises, suffering arises. And that's this, this. And as humans, as the suffering increases, as I said before, the motivation to awaken in many humans also increases. So we are here to realize this and to actually welcome the challenges we are confronted with externally because they are a great opportunity for the awakening of consciousness. Humans don't awaken except through difficulties, obstacles, problems challenges. And then your state of consciousness, the state of consciousness with which you meet the external situation changes. 
which means how the way in which you experience an external situation changes. And now this sounds a little mystical. What subsequently happens on an external level is also to a large extent determined by your state of consciousness in the present moment. What subsequently happens in the so-called future, which never comes, because you can only experience the future as the present moment, so you can never experience the future except as a thought form. <laughs> so, interesting to realize this, the only reality the future has is as a thought form. You cannot actually say, oh, there it is, because the moment you say there it is, it's the present. <laughs> so the how things evolve in the so-called future uh, are linked in very fundamental way to the your state of conscience in the present. So if you meet a difficult situation or a difficult person in a state of consciousness that is not reactive, but in an awakened state of consciousness, which means present, alert, then it changes also the situation, the external situation, how it develops from the, the, there onward. Or you can, but if you're unconscious, you face an external situation and you amplify the problem of the external situation that you're facing by your unconscious reactivity of the, the egoic self. It feels threatened in the situation, has a new smart anxiety, then all the things that you do in order to remove the situation or make it better actually makes it worse. <laughs> So it amplifies when you're unconsciously reacting all the time. And you can, you can observe it even just meeting a single human being, a difficult human being. And many human beings are very difficult, you might have noticed. So you meet a difficult human being, how you react if, you, if this difficult human being triggers the same in you, an angry human being triggers anger in you, then you amplify his or her anger and then it grows and grows and grows. It might it become violence? And this applies to any situation. What if you are in a reactive, unconscious, the unconscious state of reactivity, then you amplify the problem. <laughs> uh, and this is what happens a lot on every level here. This is an unconscious way of dealing with things. Whenever you're motivated by fear or anger, this is what happens. You think you're you are resolving the situation, but you're amplifying it. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> so the key is then to, dis to, to realize this dimension within yourself that is beyond the thinking mind and the, all the mental emotional turbulence. And this happens very easily in a moment like now, when your mind, your thinking mind subsides, comes to a stop. Now, what remains? You can't say what remains, but you know what remains directly. The sense of presence cannot be defined. The sense of beingness This is the most beautiful thing, these moments without thought, 
but you don't it's not loss of consciousness it's loss of thinking when it's not needed because thinking is useful for many things and destructive for many other things and so you discover when it's useful and you let go of it when it's destructive when it destroys your enjoyment of life your enjoyment of the present moment your ability to to just be to 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 acknowledge the aliveness of things around you to acknowledge the present moment to, to be to have some gratitude for the richness of life and all, all life forms around you all this you lose when you are continuously absorbed only in thinking what remains then when thinking subsides awareness remains or presence whatever you want to call it in religious traditions in mystical christianity it's it's called the christ within in some buddhist schools it is called your buddha nature these are just names to, to, to talk about it that's what remains when thinking subsides and there's only a sense of spacious presence like now and in that spacious presence strange thing is you don't know anything anymore of course because there's no concepts anymore in your mind you don't know anything on the level of concepts and yet that is the essence of who you are this beingness or presence so you don't know yourself anymore as an object which is when you live through the ego then you become an object to yourself in your consciousness and you have a relationship with yourself you can say i love myself which is better than hating yourself but you still have a relationship with yourself you're not yourself you have a relationship with yourself it's better to love yourself than to hate yourself true but you still have a relationship with yourself this too <laughs> i love myself i'm too <laughs> but when you with the realization of being you are yourself and you so you don't cannot know yourself as an object of knowledge but you can know yourself as the eternal subject of all knowing and that's where wisdom arises this is the source of all real knowing and the source of all true intelligence is in this non-conceptual vast intelligence which is the intelligence of consciousness itself which is one with who you are and then when you can link into that you become inspired it can inspire your mind your mind can create when it's linked into that you have creative thoughts you have creative input ideas you take action that is wise rather than or as the buddhists say skillful skillful wise action rather than unconscious action that produces more suffering for yourself and others perpetuates karma so this realm of true intelligence is the non-conceptual realm yes you need concepts and you can use concepts but don't lose yourself in concepts don't lose, don't look for yourself in concepts and then have a have a narrative in your mind that's that says this is who i am it's just a story of one concept linking linked with others concepts the this story of yourself is not essentially who you are it's a, it's a story for this this limited entity the person it's a surface phenomenon it's not who you are but it's the realization of who you are 
That's the awakening, but it's not conceptual. So look for the cessation of thought. Look for it in little moments, like now. Whenever you look at something natural, the sky, a tree, the ocean, any plant or flower or animal. Don't label it, just be alert and present and perceive it. And as I said before, when you go into anything natural, when you go into nature, you can then sense something that is almost awe-inspiring. I'm not romanticizing nature. I also, of course, nature can also kill you, but there is, there is something there that is holy or sacred. And humans have to find that urgently because then they are not going to destroy nature anymore. Ultimately, humans have been destroying nature for some time because they have lost the ability to sense what's there. And then you can cut down, I mean, I'm, there are old forests, still, some are still here in Canada and other parts of the world. There are forests that have been there with gigantic trees that have been there for thousands of years, thousands of years. They are sacred spaces. And, but if humans cannot sense it anymore, then all they see is possible profit. What can we do with it? What can we do with it? They look at the whole world in terms of doing what I can, what can I do with it? <laughs> because they have lost sense of being. It's a terrible loss. So, but you've also lost it with reference to yourself. You can't sense your own being. That's why you cannot sense the forest. You can't sense your own holiness. And that's why you cannot sense the holiness of the forest or the sky or the ocean. <laughs> so, It's not impossibly difficult. What I am suggesting is the most important task in your life, which has become particularly almost, one could say urgent at the present time. This is the task of realizing the transcendent dimension to who you are by the simple, very simply by realizing that you do not have to think all the time, that there's always a possibility in yourself is just waiting to be discovered. You are waiting to be discovered, so to speak. That, that dimension is always there. The moment thinking subsides, you feel that stillness. It's another word you can use. In a, there's a stillness. I wrote a little book called Stillness Speaks. It's a small book designed for meditative reading, not consecutive reading, just little, little, just little entries. The first sentence in the book, if I remember correctly, is you are never more essentially yourself than when you are still. So when you're, this is the same thing, it's just another term pointer to describe it. You are still when the mind subsides, but awareness is not lost. In fact, awareness has grown. Consciousness, awareness. This is the light of consciousness that Jesus said, you are 